as all of you have probably seen on the program, this panel has been titled, Defeat the Brute Within. But I've taken the prerogative of chairing this closing panel, of changing the title to, What Are Two Nice Jewish Boys Like You Doing in the Heart of Dixie? <laughs> Harley questions the nice characterization. We'll judge that later <laughs> for Stanley. <laughs> um, we were talking a little bit earlier today, and uh, both Stanley and Harley have actually spent more than 50% of their lives living in the Deep South, all in the period since what Mr. LaRouche described yesterday and today as the launching of the Southern strategy. So for both of our speakers tonight, it was not only a matter of intellectual pursuit, but good mental hygiene to have looked deep into the soul of this Confederate disease and to have, in the case of Stanley, uh, come up with a very, very detailed, extremely important and hygienic expose of what are the underlying axioms behind the Southern strategy. And for Harley, the issue has been developing an idea of the classical culture and the concept of the sublime as developed during this weekend by Mr. LaRouche as the antidote to that disease. Now, back in the middle of the 1970s, in typical LaRouche playful fashion, uh, Linda LaRouche wrote a pamphlet called The Secrets Known Only to the Inner Elites. The playful aspect of it is that this pamphlet was published and distributed on every street corner in the United States and as many other countries as we were actively organizing at the time. And in contrast to the charlatans and liars who've co-opted the concept of clash of civilizations and culture wars in recent years, what LaRouche developed is that the essential features of world history have been the struggle between two contending outlooks, that of the Platonic Socratic school of republicanism and that of the Aristotelian school of oligarchism, romanticism, existentialism, and the rest, typified in the United States in the modern period in the Nashville agrarians and the ideology of the Southern strategy. So to give us a real in-depth presentation on that Southern strategy ideology, let me turn the microphone over to Stan Ezrol. So the main problem to be solved tonight or worked on tonight is why people aren't having more fun. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to give you a little bit of a map of enemy terrain, um, namely the terrain inside your minds and the minds of the people that you deal with who are not having the fun that they ought to be having. Um, could you put up the first slide? Or I guess that's that way. The, the thing that I want to start by reminding some of you of, most of you are somewhat familiar with the Elma Gantry film and the image of Burt Lancaster down on all fours in church barking like a dog. Most of you do not get down on your knees on all four in church and bark like dogs, and most of the people that you meet with don't do that on a regular basis. <laughs> However, there are many people you meet with, maybe even some people here in this room tonight, who think that fat Albert Gore is a more viable candidate for president than Lyndon LaRouche. There are many people who think that George W. Bush's advisors, there, there are some people who even think that George W. Bush is smart enough to fix things before it comes to a calamity like a world war or a total financial meltdown. 
That's sort of in the class of getting on your knees and barking like a dog. But there are a lot of people who aren't quite that bad, but who think, well, his people wouldn't let him do that. Um, there are a lot of people who think that a system of strong sovereign nation states dedicating, dedicated to protecting the general welfare of their citizens is oppressive big government and we ought to do something to control it. A lot of people think that the United States has a concern with foreign enemies, rogue states, China, Russia, terrorist threats. A lot of people think those enemies are more dangerous than the internal enemy that I told you we had to deal with tonight. Now, what I hope we can accomplish this evening is to give you enough of the sense of smell, not by releasing any odors in the hall, but by generating that smell in your mind's nose, so to speak, so that when you see these views that I've outlined within yourself or within the people you talk to, you will think, ah, there you are down on all fours, barking like a dog. Now, what we've got up here is a group of fellows, actually at the, the point that was taken, they were not as old as they look. Um, they're known as the fugitive poets, the Nashville agrarians. Um, they are for the most part third generation descendants of the Tennessee Templars who along with Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest and Albert Pike, the sovereign grand commander of the southern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, founded the Ku Klux Klan in 1866. Now, these kids, they started out on this road as kids in 1915, and their direct intellectual descendants, their collaborators, and their friends have played a leading role in shaping the environment, which shapes the way that most of you here still think to a large extent, and that certainly conditions the way that most people in American culture think. Um, you could put up slide two. They have provided the intellectual basis and the program for the upsurge of the influence of fundamentalist religious cults in political life over the last 70 years. And this includes both the Christian right and the upsurge in so-called New Age Aquarian type cults. Put up the next slide. They are the direct intellectual leaders. They and their immediate students are the direct intellectual leaders of the so-called conservative revolution associated with the names William F. Buckley, Newt Gingrich, and the other Southern strategy Republicans. Next slide. They and their collaborators have also provided the ideological basis of the systems analysis connected one worldist, pro ecology, environmentalist, counterculture freak movement, and the allied Southern strategy Democrats. Next slide. They have provided the ideological framework for the bipartisan foreign strategic and economic policy, which goes under the headings globalization or project democracy, the idea of which is that all nation states ought to be subject to some sort of global authority in terms of their credit policies, economic development policies, military and technology policies. Um, next slide. They directly created and have led the leading school of literary criticism, which dominates the Modern Language Association, which is the professional association for all university and high school 
English teachers, literature professors, and so on, which sets standards for grammar as used in our major publications, book publications, newspapers, magazines, and so on. Um, through their connections with the Hollywood move, movie industry and elsewhere, they also have played a very influential role in influencing all of the institutions of so-called culture and entertainment, typified by the Hollywood movie industry. Next slide. Now, what I hope to show tonight, and some of you have read my article on this in the EIR, most of you hopefully will, um, I can't go into a lot of detail. What I do hope to show is that for all of these seemingly disparate and in fact in some cases seemingly conflicting institutions, political trends and so on, there is one unifying idea. And to get an idea, to g give you a, a sort of brief smell of what that idea is, I would refer you to H.G. Wells' novel, The Island of Dr. Moreau which is typical, frankly, of a whole genre of science fiction and literature, which involves the idea of the half-beast, half-man. The story of the, doc of the island of Dr. Moreau is the story of a fellow named Edward Prendick, who is somewhat like the author, H.G. Wells. He was a student of Charles Darwin's boss, Thomas Henry Huxley, who found himself stranded on a tropical island with Dr. Moreau and a lot of weird creatures. The weird creatures were animals that Dr. Moreau operated on in order to try to make them human. And he had some apparent success. They were able to talk. They were able to act as household servants. They were able to prepare food. They were able to speak relatively simply sort of like a, a newscaster, a sportscaster, at about that level. Um, and they had a code of ethics that they lived by, which is, you know, things like, walk on two legs, not four, are we not men? Eat no flesh nor fish, are we not men? Um, but ultimately, the experiment didn't work and the bestial, predatory nature of these animals came to the surface. And in due course, short course really, it's a fairly short book, Dr. Moreau and his sis assistant perished at the hands of their experiments. Prendick escaped and returned to England, and as the novel concludes, Prendick in England said that as he looked at the people around him, he could not help feeling that he was still amongst the beast people of Dr. Moreau's island, and that they might at any point turn on him the way that the creatures of the island had. And then he looked up to the heavens, and he said, I take comfort in thinking that there, that within us, which is more than animal-like, can somehow, some way, be realized. Now, this, if you think about it, and I haven't given you many details, but it's actually clear from what Wells does with this book, is that this is the way he thought about it, too, is the idea, for instance, of fundamentalist religion. Here, we're all beasts. Here, we're all predators. Here, you look out for number one. You look out for yourself, your family, private enterprise, right? You want wealth? Well, let everybody look out for their own, and then we'll all have wealth, right? Um, and we love God, of course. We love God up in heaven. Don't want him down in our neighborhood. <laughs> we hope he won't come visit. <laughs> but he's the most important thing to us. Now, the, you can put that slide back up. It's, you know, as, as ugly as they are, it's probably. <laughs> the, um, 
So what you've got there, these fellows in 1915, which is the same year that evil twins were born in Hollywood through one act of birth, and that is the release of the first full-length Hollywood motion picture, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, the sales and distribution of which provided the initial financial base for developing the Hollywood movie industry, and also the circulation of which built the born-again Ku Klux Klan in the period 1915 and forward. Um, one of the key figures in that, and there were many, but one I'll mention for this purpose, was a fellow named Walter L. Fleming, who was one of the leading insider historians of the Ku Klux Klan, who issued a book on that in 1905. A couple of years after the issuance of Birth of a Nation, he was named Dean of Vanderbilt University. Um, the fellow in the bottom center there, John Crow Ransom, was the grand nephew of James Crow, who was one of Walter Fleming's chief sources. John Crow Ransom's mother, Ella, used to tell little Jimmy on her knee how she loved those good old days when she and the other Crow women would sit around the family hearth, sewing sheets together so the men folk could go to their rallies. So that, that gives you an idea of the flavor of these kids. Um, that's just a little release of aroma. But. Um, <laughs> But they began in 1915 meeting with a Rosicrucian mystic named Sidney Matatran Hirsch, who's the fellow there on the upper right, with the beard. And what he schooled them in is what William Yandel Elliott, who's the fellow on the upper left there, we'll, you'll hear touch more about him later, um, what he called the epic exemplar theory of history, which is basically your good old standard oligarchical religion that you don't know anything except what some secret mysterious character may whisper to you. Sidney Hirsch apparently called them epic exemplars. You can find terms adepts, ascended masters, magi, little green men, as LaRouge calls them. This is the stuff that the Roman mystery religions that Rosicrucian Freemasonry, theosophy, and so on, all of these things are made of. The key is, you don't know nothing. But if you get on the inside with those of us that do know, well then maybe you can make something of yourself. Um, they became, in the 20s, famous leaders of the modernist poetry and literary movement. One of the key ways in which they became this was that William Yandel Elliott was one of about five of these good old boys from Nashville who became a Rhodes Scholar. In the early 20s, while they were publishing Fugitive magazine, he was listed as the editor in absentia. And he would stay up all night drinking with William Butler Yeats, the occultist poet, with Robert Graves, who's known to some of you as the author of the I Claudius novels, which PBS did a famous television series on, and who also is known for his great work on the cult of the white goddess, the basis of all true religion. Um, now, and the, the circles that they became prominent in were the circles of the bohemian generation of poets, the precursors of the beat and the hippie generation. Fellow on the lower left there, Alan Tate, for instance, went to Paris and used to spend his Thursday afternoons with Gertrude Stein and her wife, Alice B. Toklas, eating hashish, no, I'm sorry, he claims he never ate the chocolate cake. Um, and he, he claims that it was only served to the women in the back room because despite the, the fact that these fellows are, or whatever they are, are heroes of the gay rights movement, Gertrude Stein would not let Alice sit in the front room with the men. <laughs> um, but they were upset at the treatment given the Southern culture 
by the literary elites. And in the late 20s, they resolved to do something about this. And you could put up the next slide. What they did in the period from about 1929 to 1931 is to release a series of books. The centerpiece of this series is this, I'll Take My Stand, which is advertised here as the revolt of the young South against machine civilization. Um, it was dedicated to Walter Fleming, the insider historian of the Ku Klux Klan. The publication of this collection was organized by Alan Tate in between his sessions at Gertrude Stein's in Paris, where he was also working on another one of the books released in this period, his biography of General Stonewall Jackson. Um, the, to make it clear at the outset what this book was, I'll tell you what was said in its concluding essay. The concluding essay was written by Stark Young who was the most famous at that point of the 12 agrarian authors. Now Stark Young was in the middle of the movement of H.G. Wells, Bertrand Russell, and H.G. Wells' two main protégés, Aldous and Julian Huxley, in the United States. Young was a, on the editorial board of the H.G. Wells organ known as the New Republic, which still functions today as such. Um, also was a lifelong homosexual. What he wrote in his concluding essay is that the South saw the rise of a certain kind of aristocratic lifestyle. It was based on the copious ownership of land and many slaves. And that is what this book has been written about. And I just thought I would say that at the outset because as these people went on and did other things, Many people have tried to say that that book didn't say what it said and didn't mean what it meant. Now, specifically, what they painted in that book is this. They started by saying, all tend to support a Southern way of life against what may be called the American or prevailing way, agrarian versus industrial. Now, and they spelled out in some detail what they meant by that. And what they meant by that is that the, there's a terrible thing that was, uh, happened to the human race as epitomized by the development of the United States of America. And that that terrible thing was cognition. And that the way that things really ought to be is that people just should sort of lie there like turds on the ground and just sort of stay the same generation from generation to generation. And they, for instance, go back to what they liked about the Roman Republic. What they liked about the Roman Republic before the speculators and corn laws had driven men from the soil to the city slums was that they reeked of the soil, of the plow and the spade. They had wrestled with virgin soil and forest. And they trace out that development through England, declaring that they are Anglophiles and that they chiefly base themselves on the model of England. And I don't really think this is what happened in England, but what they say happened in England is that the English settled their country figured out how to live in harmony with nature, made a truce with nature, and have lived the same way ever since. Whereas the American way makes an unrelenting war against nature. And it thrusts you into an infinite series of progress. You know, the the idea that you might discover something, that you might figure out how to make improvements, that you might do that and then say, aha, we can do it even better. That's the infinite series of progress. They don't let us just lie alone. Why don't they leave us be? Um, and I want to 
give you a little idea of what this means for cognition. This is from Robert Penn Warren, who ultimately became the most famous and successful of the group. Um, got two Pulitzer Prizes, had a couple of Hollywood movies made of his books, became the first poet laureate of the United States in 1986. Um, and what I'm going to read you is a view that he held, which never really changed, although later in life he promoted himself as an advocate of civil rights, a friend of Dr. Martin Luther King. The Negro was as little equipped to establish himself, he's talking now of the freed slaves after the Civil War, was as little equipped to establish himself as he would have been to live again with spear and breech clout in the Sudan or Bantu country. The necessities of life had always found their way to his back or skillet without the least thought on his part. He did not know how to make a living. Always in the past, he had been told when to work and what to do. For what is the Negro to be educated? In the past, the Southern Negro has always been a creature of the small town and farm. That is where he still chiefly belongs, by temperament and capacity. Some of you may think that that's a racist statement. Robert Penn Warren did not think so to his dying day. At the, a year before this book was published, he published a biography of the abolitionist John Brown, in which he said that one of the, the problems that led to the Civil War is that people in the North who had never really seen slavery for what it really was developed some theory about how it was evil but that the slaves themselves never bothered their kinky heads about it. <laughs> because they had everything taken care of this. And, and to prove that this statement is not racist, I will read you from his friend, Alan Tate. Alan Tate, who be, was at that point called by T.S. Eliot, the greatest poet writing in America, who later on was sent on tours by the CIA and the State Department to promote American culture abroad, wrote in I'll Take My Stand, the South could remain simple-minded because it had no use for the intellectual agility required to define its position. The Southern mind was simple, not top-heavy with learning it had no use of, we are very near an answer to our question. How may the Southerner take hold of his tradition? The answer is by violence. A few years later, he wrote that he was a white supremacist, that he didn't like lynching, but that if you want to stop lynching, don't bother the people doing the lynching. It's very simple eliminate the fear of the whites that their supremacy will be challenged and lynching will stop. Now, um, next slide. Also in this book, in an article by Andrew Nelson Lytle titled Behind Tit, Lytle wrote, profits do not come from cities they have always come from the wilderness, stinking of goats and running with lice. And I, I hope you're beginning to see a certain theme that's developing here about what sensations these fellows sort of like. <laughs> um, at the same time, this great classic work was issued, Bedford Forrest and his Critter Company which was a loving homage to the first imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, Nathan Bedford Forrest. Um, the point of that book, people have asked me, well, why is it called Nathan Bedford Forrest and the Critter Company? Well, it's about a cavalry outfit 
and they've got horses and so on who are critters. But you look at the book, and what it talks about is the intelligence and wisdom of the members of the company, namely the horses. They'd perk their ears up. They'd sniff their noses. They'd sense what was coming next. Said a few things about the less intelligent members of the company on their backs, on the backs of the critters. Um, and what he promulgated in this book is a very common myth about the founding of the United States and one which is rampant to today in this conservative movement as well as in other circles. What he said is that contrary to what we know, which is that the, Eng the English colonization of the Americas was something that was led by the friends of William Shakespeare in order to get away from religious warfare in Europe, in order to have a relatively safe base from which to establish a sovereign nation, what Andrew Nelson Lytle writes is that the forests, like their friends who came to America, came to appease their nostalgia for feudalism. A few years before this, a fellow named Christopher Hollis, who is part of an English Catholic movement known as the Distributists, issued a book titled The American Heresy in which he said essentially the same thing in some more detail, that America had been founded to be a feudal agrarian society, but that a heresy was introduced by Alexander Hamilton, Henry Carey, and Abraham Lincoln, which turned it instead into an industrial nation. And we'll hear more about the distributors later. Um, let's have the next slide. At the same time, a very important book, but one that you don't hear promoted as widely was issued. It was titled God Without Thunder, written by John Crow Ransom, the white diaper baby you saw up there a little while earlier. What Ransom did in God Without Thunder is to give a detailed theological and philosophical explanation of the same ideas which were in I'll Take My Stand. Um, what he says in that book is that we have a problem, which is that what he calls the God of the Old Testament, the God of thunder. And let's say I don't think he's entirely accurate about his Old Testament interpretation, but we won't get into that now, because he's very clear about what he liked a God that you were terrified of, a God like Jonathan Edwards' God, the God that is ready to stomp on you and let your blood splat all over his garments because that's the way he shows his majesty, by not caring whether you are good or evil, not caring whether nations are good or evil, but he shows his majesty by stomping on the ones he doesn't like and raising up the ones he does like just because that's the way he likes it. That's Jonathan Edwards' God, and that is the God that John Crow Ransom mourns the loss of. Not because John Crow Ransom was a believer in that God or any God, as he makes clear, but as he says in the introductory letter, which is addressed to his guru, Sidney Matatrin Hirsch, he wishes to explain to the Western world of America the function of the myths in human civilization. How do you use myths to control people? Um, now, in developing his history of how it is that we turned away from this Godzilla god, God, um, he goes back as far as Plato. He describes the beginning of the development of Plato's idea of the idea of human cognition as the perilous step man had taken towards his later civilization when he introduced agriculture and aid of flesh. Here lay the origin of the strife between the animal species when man began to enforce the fact of his superiority by militants and aggression 
And then what he says is that what he likes are the fundamentalists. Why does he like the fundamentalists? Because the fundamentalist does not any longer distinguish myth and fact. But why should he if the myth is worth believing in? And he also throws in a little bit of Sidney Matatran Hirsch's training here, that what you really get ideas from are demons, which he says are the same as devils. That Socrates got his ideas from a demon and so on and so forth. That it's the demon that you get all of your ideas from. Now, what became of this movement whose ideas were outlined in I'll Take My Stand, Bedford Forest and his Critter Company, God Without Thunder, and so on, was what was called the, Agrarian, uh, the Alliance of Agrarian and Distributist Groups, which was active throughout the early part of the 30s up through about 1937. Um, the distributists I mentioned before were anti-Renaissance Catholics who viewed the worst disaster. Well, let me go back. I skipped over one thing in God with Thunder, which is an important point. What, what John Crow Ransom complained about is the filioque as being the worst point in the history of the human race. Now, what's the filioque? Like Dr. Franklin and unlike Elmer Gantry, I'm not dogmatic in matters of religion. But what the filioque was, was the idea that God, who is, that Christ, who is man, shares in the creative capability of God in heaven. That God has the capability of understanding and furthering the understanding of the principles by which the universe was created. That's what John Crow Ransom did not like. That's what I do like, Lyndon LaRouche likes, it's what Nicholas of Cusa liked, it's what I believe Pope John Paul II likes about the filioque. Um, now, what John Crow Ransom did is to conclude his book with a programmatic call in which he said, well, what should we do about this? Some people might think that we should all join the Orthodox churches since they never accepted the filioque. And he said, but you know what kind of people they have in those churches? I would find that abhorrent. Well, why not forget Christ altogether and go back to the synagogue? Abhorrent. What about the Roman Catholic Church? Well, the West has been fighting against Rome. Well, what about the English Catholic, the Anglican, or the Episcopal churches? Well, now you're talking, I am an Anglophile, but no, I don't think Americans will buy it. So the call he ends with, which should sound like something familiar, something resembling something that maybe you've seen, is that whatever church you are in, turn it back to fundamentalism whatever church you are in, turn it away from the soft half-man, half-God. Turn it away from the God that you think can love you, from the God you think you can understand. Turn it away from what he, he describes Christ as the patron of science, and turn it back to the God of thunder, the God of terror. Um, so as I started to say before, out of this arose an alliance between the agrarians and these anti-Renaissance, pro-feudal Catholics known as the distributists. The primary historical sympathy of the distributists was with the Spanish Habsburgs because just as they saw the Renaissance of the 15th century as being the worst disaster to befall man because of its promotion of this idea of the capability of the scientific efforts of man and so on. They, sh they saw the heroic efforts 
of Carlos V of Spain and especially of his son, Philip II, to destroy the Renaissance as being the most heroic struggle that traditional society had waged against what, what they describe, and they would often describe the Renaissance as paganism because of its revival of Plato. Interestingly, Aristotle to these people was divine, but Plato was a pagan. Neither one of them, of course, were Christians. Um, the, this alliance involved the publication of an openly pro-fascist magazine called the American Review, which praised Hitler, Mussolini, propagandized against any attempt to militarily restrain the fascist and Nazi regimes. The key figures in the distributist movement were Hilaire Belloc and G.K. Chesterton. Belloc had written a book titled The Jews, and in the edition of that book, published in the period of his alliance with the agrarians in 1937, he said that he admired the heroic efforts of the Nazi regime to finally deal with the Jewish question, with his only concern being that their efforts would not provide a final solution for all of Europe. And just in, in fairness to Hilaire Belloc, he did not say that all Jews should be killed. What he did say is that a natural nation is one that is based on one ethnic grouping in one limited area, and that therefore no foreign ethnic group could be considered citizens of a nation, and that what the Jews ought to do is renounce citizenship in any non-Jewish nation that they were in, and then they could live in peace. Now, without going into further detail, this alliance of agrarians and distributists became somewhat unpopular in the course of the Second World War, but it was revived immediately after the Second World War, and it was revived, if you put up slide 11, it was revived under the patronage of the pro-feudalist Catholic Buckley family, William F. and all of his brothers and so on. What we know as the conservative movement associated with Buckley includes amongst its ideological figures the following people who are direct students of the agrarians. Richard Weaver, Melvin E. Bradford, Frederick Wil Wilhelmson, Russell Kirk, Wilmore Kendall, then the next generation student, Thomas Fleming. These are the people who wrote and directed the Buckleyite publications including Modern Age, the Journal of Buckley's Intercollegiate Studies Institute, National Review, Chronicles, which is the Journal of the Rockford Institute, and so on. What you see there is evidence of a now existing typical product of the Agrarian Distributist Alliance. This is from the website of Christendom College in Front Royal, Virginia, um, which bills itself as America's premier Catholic college. Um, it was founded with Buckley money. It has a student lounge and billiard hall named Chester Belloc after the pro-Nazi distributors, G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc. What you see there is an announcement for a program on liturgical music held last June featuring Thomas Fleming, who was a founder of the pro-Ku Klux Klan, pro-Confederate Southern Partisan Magazine, a founder of the pro-Ku Klux Klan, pro-Confederate Southern Patriot Magazine, who is a board member of the League of the South, who is an open advocate for a new conf secession of the Confederacy, and who works in alliance with separatist organizations in the Balkans, in Southeast Asia, and elsewhere who are attempting, using terrorists and other means, to destroy nation states wherever they can. Uh, now put up slide 12. 
So there, what, what we've gone over so far, just to recap, is the influence of the agrarians. One thing that I hope you have sort of detected and picked up is that taking away certain kind of drawl, taking away certain kinds of references to Negros and so on, their, view are, is their views on technology, science, and the environment are no different from Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, no different from Fat Albert Gore, no different from this in, entire movement who take any idea and propose any idea that may seem good and propose that it's the most dangerous thing that's hit us. Now, what most historians of the agrarians claim is that this political episode in the 30s was temporary, that they gave it up, they abandoned it, and they went on to brilliant literary careers. And here you just see the scene at the Library of Congress where you've got John Crow Ransom, Cleanth Brooks sitting on the left, their friend Eudora Welty in the middle. And you know, I won't go into detail now, but they dominated the whole Library of Congress literary apparatus. They got prizes. They decided who else got the prizes and so on. Now what I want to do is briefly look at the, what the new criticism is, which I, I think you will agree with me after hearing it, I was absolutely right to call the new criticism. Um, and you can see how different it is from agrarianism. Um, first, give you an idea of what they don't like. I'll just read to you from John Crow Ransom's most famous essay of literary criticism, Shakespeare at Sonnets in which he attacks Shakespeare for being a careless workman because he violated some of the rules of English sonnet writing, which John Crow Ransom invented 300 years after Shakespeare's death. <laughs> and this is what he had to say about Shakespeare otherwise, when taking objection to Shakespeare's reference to the soul of the wide dreaming world. The world soul is a technical concept, I suppose, in the sense that it was of use to Paracelsus and to other theosophists. It indicates a very fine image for some metaphysical poet who will handle it technically for Don or another university poet. It is not fit for amateurs. The question is, whether Shakespeare's theological touch here is not amateurish. Elsewhere, it sometimes is, as in Hamlet's famous soliloquy, beginning to be or not to be. <laughs> now, what underlay this view of Shakespeare is the following. We have elected to know the world through science. But science is only the cognitive department of our animal life. And by it, we know the world only as a scheme of abstract conveniences. What we cannot know constitutionally as scientists is the world which is made up of whole and indefeasible objects. And this is the world which poetry recovers for us. Science gratifies a practical impulse and exhibits the minimum of perception. Art gratifies a perceptual impulse and exhibits the minimum of reason. In case that wasn't clear, I'll read you briefly a letter to Alan Tate, his friend. Biologically, man is peculiar in that he must record and use his successive experiences. The beasts are not under this necessity. With them, the experience is an end in itself and takes care of itself. Now, what I'll just ask you to think about is what he is saying is that the role of poetry, of literature, of all art is to take that impulse in you toward reason, toward cognition, toward science, and make sure that it gets directed back toward that part of you that you share with the beasts. 
the five senses, and you know which is the favorite, <laughs> and the appetites. Let's have the next slide. Now, as I said, the, these fellows realized that some of their views were getting unpopular in the late 40s. William Yandel Elliott, who at that point was the head of the Harvard Government Department, who had written a number of books, including The New British Empire and the Need for Constitutional Reform, about the need to turn the United States into a government based on a permanent bureaucracy tied to a nobility, as was his beloved Britain, joined with Herbert Agar, who was another collaborator of the agrarians, and also with Bertrand Russell's agent in the United States, Robert Maynard Hutchins, and a number of other people who you would tend to identify as being sort of leftists, like the novelist Thomas Mann, in issuing a book in 1940 called The City of Man, A Declaration of World D Democracy, which was an appeal for the United States to join the war effort in defense of beloved Britain, but only on very special terms. Namely, that the war be used to destroy all nations and to establish a new government of a particular sort. And I'll read you a little bit from that. The war must guarantee that the heresy of nationalism is conquered and the absurd architecture of the present world is finally dismantled. And what they want to get away from are these nations based on ideas and back to a, a situation in which each nation is, rises from the natural conditions of each one's soil. They want to stop the blind effects of the overgrowth of the machine age. Under whose authority should this be? Godzilla's. In this ca case, they name it the Holy Ghost. They call the Holy Ghost the head of the re new religion of democracy. And they quote scripture in defense of this view, saying, blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. They want a New Testament of Americanism in which all institutions must now be controlled and they list them family, education, neighborhood, and church, all must come under the dictatorial control of their new Holy Ghost for the crime of meddling in the anarchy of nations. This they refer to as the pruning of the tree of freedom in order to make it more fruitful. And they demand that this government be enforced through having one military and police authority on the earth. This is not a science fiction movie. This is something that was pushed by people and after the war William Yandel Elliott served on Dwight Eisenhower's National Security Council. He served on a number of commissions which helped reorganize the government moving toward the kind of permanent bureaucracy bringing in non-elected extra constitutional bodies like the National Security Council, the National Economic Council, and so on. Um, so that this was something which was an active idea and to the extent that you know something about what is today called project democracy and globalization under which flag the United States, Britain, and so on will overthrow elected leaders like Fujimori of Peru in the name of democracy because he fought the drug trade. We will attempt to overthrow Mahathir of Malaysia because he attempted to defend the currency of his nation. This is an idea which is being put into practice. Now, in a moment, I'm going to let you listen to what William Yandel Elliott said. What you're gonna hear are remarks, which when you can put up slide 14, what you're going to hear are remarks which were, which he made to the fugitive reunion in 1956, which was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. 
At that point, as I said, he was on Dwight Eisenhower's National Security Council. He was working very closely with his prime protege, Dr. Henry Kissinger. He had co-authored co with Kissinger Western Political Heritage, which had become the main um, Western Civilization textbook for training all of Harvard's freshmen and so on. Um, and he and Kissinger together had hosted something called the Harvard International Summer Seminars, which brought world leaders in who showed some promise in order to indoctrinate them. And the fugitives were often the people that were invited to be the guest lecturers at these summer seminars. Kissinger, up through 1963 as the hosts of these seminars, continued to work directly with people like Alan Tate, Andrew Nelson Lytle, who were brought in there. Um, Eliot had founded a literary magazine, Confluence, to be edited by his protege, Kissinger. Alan Tate, the agrarian, served on the editorial board with him. Um, Earlier, in, in remarks that I'm not going to play for you, Eliot said that he had often brought gatherings of fugitives up to Harvard to do poetry programs and so on. So now let's have the first section and hear what William Yandel Eliot said. I think we should keep the uh, fugitives reunion slide up throughout. Um, so play the first segment of the tape. that Johnny Ransom did in this group, and I may be forgiven for speaking of it as one who certainly from the earliest time profited by his immediate friendship as well as his teaching. It was to set a model of gentility, of courtesy, of detachment and fairness, of absolute uh, urbanity under all conditions that made the exchanges that we had moderated by the most unprofessional moderator that ever successfully schooled a group of poets. And he's gone on schooling poets ever since and schooling many another young man in the, the real aesthetics of the world, not those that are taught simply in books, but the feeling for beauty in language and for clarity and precision and for all the other things that uh, poets have come to cherish, largely because of Johnny's own example, the understatement, the lack of uh, sentimentality, and yet the true and moving sentiment that has characterized his poems can best be judged if you listen to them or if you read them. There's no use talking about them in other terms. Johnny today is a national and an international figure. He's been honored in many, many ways, but I suppose no honor has ever meant more to him than coming back here tonight, and I felt that in the words that he said so simply and rightly at the dinner this evening, given in his honor as much as any other person or more in the fugitive group. We would all accord him that right. Now that, of course, was Bill Elliott on the upper left there, and you can just keep the slide up and Johnny Crow Ransom in the center bottom. Um, and of course, this is John Crow Ransom of God Without Thunder. John Crow Ransom of cognition is the biggest enemy in the history of the human race, who he's talking about. Now let's hear the next tape segment. If I can't forbear to mention the name of Sidney Hirsch, Upper right. a mystic, a philosopher, a rather unusual and well-schooled man, whom we just forcibly captured and kidnapped today in spite of all his objections and brought back to be a member of the group once more and told him that we would not stand for any nonsense, that here he was and whether he was on or off campus, we, <laughs> he was a part of us and so he is and so he was because he was one of the great uh, philosophical forces and surely one of the contributing forces to the fugitive group, and this I think we all cheerfully acknowledge, and we, we had what was a very much better session for his presence this afternoon. 
If Muhammad wouldn't come to the mountain, we just moved the mountain to come to the several Muhammads who were glad to welcome him. And, and it was a very happy occasion for all of us to have him back. Now that, of course, is Sidney Hirsch, who I told you about. At the point when, as William Yandale Elliott said, he and others went to Sidney Hirsch's home and brought him back, I've seen a published article on this and interviewed some people in Nashville at the time. Sidney Hirsch lived alone. He had a club chair, an overstuffed chair that he liked to sit on while he talked to guests. There was a human pelvis hanging from the ceiling above the chair, which he would stroke as he talked to them. There was a life-size nude portrait of himself behind the chair, and it was filled with various artifacts of oriental mystical significance. Um, and remember, just as Sidney Hirsch, as William Yandel Elliott called Sidney Hirsch one of the most powerful intellectual influence on his life, Henry Kissinger said of William Yandel Elliott that he owed more to him, both intellectually and humanly, than to any man he had known. Let's hear the next segment. I could say things about Penn Warren and, and for that matter, about Alan Tate. Among the more sophisticated of our group, Alan has always been sophisticated to a very great degree. He educated us all by introducing us to such unknown phenomena as T.S. Eliot uh, and uh, the wasteland and the several bypaths of Malamé and, and uh, uh, very many other things that were quite unknown territory to the simple-minded Tennesseans that we were then. Uh, it's true that many of us had been exposed in varying degrees and during the war. And we began before the war, you know, as a group, but we went on after the war and published this little magazine. But I think we owe a remarkable degree to the precise and tight reasoning of Alan Tate and to the discipline of his own mind and to the extraordinary sophistication of his knowledge of things, the kind of things that the fugitives stand for. And today, Alan Tate, too, as well as Johnny Ransom, is a national figure, respected for his contributions. He does go on writing poetry, I'm happy to say. One of the nicest things that I've found in this thing is that, that some of the fugitives do produce still. Now that, of course, is Alan Tate on the lower left, who you will recall is not top-heavy with learn, and he had no use of. So you have to ask what it was. Um, <laughs> let's listen to the next segment. And I see one of them sitting before me, whom I hate to reveal and strip of his uh, uh, covert uh, activities under the guise of a banker, he still writes very beautiful sonnets, Alex Stevenson. He had perhaps the most lyrical and genuine gift of any member of the group, unless it be Don Davidson, whose ear for music was the equal of any member of the groups, and whose natural and beautiful poetry, found in an expression like uh, Lee in the Mountains, Don Davidson's Lee in the Mountains, 1865-1870, one of the really great pieces, from my point of view, that the fugitives produced. So these people, Don has been drawn into public affairs in his own way, as I have in my own way. I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how ardently he's still an agrarian, but he is uh, certainly a uh, conservative. And, uh, <laughs> And he has contributed very greatly to the feeling of the tradition of the tall men and of Tennesseans, though he's a Georgian, and we love him. Now that's Don Davidson on the lower right. Um, you might have noticed some laughter. And this will give you a lesson in why it is sometimes important, particularly when listening to men in public affairs speak, to know what they're not saying, as the people laughing did. But many of you did not. Donald Davidson at that time was a leader of the Tennessee White Citizens Commissions. In other words, he was still at that point a leader of the Ku Klux Klan, if 
fighting to maintain segregation. Interestingly, Donald Davidson's life work, really, his most important written output, was not poetry, it was not fiction. He wrote an awful novel about the Grand Old Opry, which was finally published about 50 years after he died. Um, his most important literary output was a two-volume history of the Tennessee River, not of Tennessee, of the river, which was part of the campaign against the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is part of the movement which some of you may be familiar with in the Northwest and so on, to on-dam rivers in order to make them safe for the fishes and to stop man's relentless war against nations. So there you've got a great environmentalist Ku Klux Klan hero. Now let's hear the next part of the tape. I, I could, I suppose, signal out Andrew Lytle, too, another distant cousin of mine. I just come to him next because he's sitting next to him. As a man who has uh, gone on after he ceased being a poet, though he still writes on the sly, as we all do, you know, um, some of the most brilliant novels that the country has produced. I think this would be a, 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 a judgment accorded him by one of the acknowledged great novelists of the country, Robert Penn Warren, who also writes today and publishes, I'm happy to say, some of the most distinguished poetry that the country produces. Now, Penn Warren tells me that he's ceasing to be a professor at Yale and is going to be a professional man of letters. He says this is a very natural choice, but having been a professor so long, I can tell you I don't know how he faces shivering in the cold, cold world as a writer, unless it be the fact that he can sell the royalties on his books for some hundreds of thousand dollars, and I suppose that he still continues to do that. You've all seen them, and I, I need no, add nothing about the quality and the remarkable perception of human nature that Penn Warren has done. But to me, he's a Kentucky boy, deeply imbued with the tradition of the bluegrass region, with a knowledge of the violence and the tragedy of human nature, and a very deep understanding of many elements of its history. Now, Andrew Nelson Lytle is not in the picture. This great novelist, of course, is Andrew Nelson Lytle of the stinking like goats and running with lice. He's the Andrew Nelson Lytle of Bedford Forest's Critter Company. He also, give you an idea of how this thing worked, he also was the host at his farm in Monteagle, Tennessee, of the founding meeting of a traditionalist Anglican association known as the Book of Common Prayer, which seeks to restore the beautiful old liturgy of the church. Cleanth Brooks, the agrarian, was also present there, as was the homosexual poet W.H. Auden. Um, he also, in 1979, was one of the founders of the Southern Partisan and remained an editorial advisor until his death in, I believe it was 1994. After his death in 1994, as a tribute to him, the Southern Partisan then patronized, and as you know, it's been patronized by our leading Southern strategy Republicans like John Ash Ashcroft, Trent Lott, and so on, said that Critter Company was literature on a par with Homer. Now, just to wrap this up, William Yandel Elliott, I've said, was the prime mentor of Henry Kissinger. Another one of his protégés was Zbigniew Wyszynski, who was the leading guru of Democratic Party foreign policy, the fellow that discovered Jimmy Carter, brought him into the Trilateral Commission, and made him President of the United States. Both Kissinger and Dzerzhinsky are now at the Center for Strategic and International Studies together, which has been one of the major think tanks in developing military and other foreign strategic policy for the so-called post-detente era. CSIS is the think tank that in the early 80s brought together Al Gore, Newt Gingrich, Brent Scowcroft, and others of that ilk, 
in order to formulate what they called the horses and rabbits strategy. The strategy that says that the advanced nations are the horses above the battle and we have allies as well as enemies who are the rabbits who fight and die for us on the ground. Um, and just what I want to do before concluding is remind you of a famous address made in furtherance of this strategy by Dr. Henry Kissinger, May 10th, 1982, to the Royal Institute of International Affairs. And hopefully you will recognize in this his intellectual debt to the fugitives and the agrarians. Um, what he said is, many American leaders condemn Churchill as needlessly obsessed with power politics, too rigidly anti-Soviet, too colonialist, and too little interested in building the fundamentally new international order towards which American idealism always tended. The dispute was resolved according to American preferences, in my view, to the detriment of post-war security. Fortunately, Britain had a decisive influence over America's rapid awakening to maturity in the years following. In my White House incarnation then, I kept the British Foreign Office better informed and more closely engaged than I did the American State Department. So there you have it. You may have to review some of the material. You may have to think about it. But what you've got dominating the political thinking of both of our parties, of our educational, cultural, and entertainment institutions, and many of our religious institutions, particularly many of our religious institutions that tend to be prominent in politics, is the idea that your minds, your ability to use your minds in the way that we've been discussing throughout this weekend, your cognitive capabilities are an evil to be extirpated and that you really would be much happier down on all fours like a dachshund dragging your nose, sniffing for turds. And if you think about it, I would, th I, I would imagine you would recognize that many of you and many of the people that you know psychologically are in that state a lot of the time. Keep your head down. Keep out of trouble. Now, what I would propose is that you keep your head up and keep in trouble. The air is a lot fresher, and you can see a lot further. So have fun. Are we not human? As many of you probably know, recently Executive Intelligence Review published a 54-page article by Stan, which goes through far more detail than we had time for this evening, called How the Lost Corpse Subverts the American Intellectual Tradition. Uh, at the close of this session, Stan uh, has agreed to be over there at the literature table, where there's a stack of copies of that EIR, and for anybody who does not have a copy, I would urge you to purchase it tonight and probably an opportunity exists to get an autographed copy of that article as well. Now, two other brief public announcements. If anybody checked any of your personal items with security, please remember to stop at the security table outside the conference hall 
at the end of this session to pick them up. The alternative is that they'll be raffled Tuesday morning in Leesburg. If there's anything of... Uh, as people know, at the close of this session, we will have finished the open Labor Day weekend conference of the ICLC Schiller Institute. The internal business conference will begin tomorrow morning in this same room at 11 a.m. And all guests who have been invited to attend the internal must register outside the Lake Ann room, which is one of the rooms along the corridor here. Regions should provide an organizer at the registration table with their guest list for the registration. And that will begin at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Now, Stanley and his wife Stephanie spent a number of years in the belly of the beast in uh, various cities around North Carolina. And after a while, had the uh, good sense to try to take the Underground Railroad and head north. Wound up in the uh, nation's capital of Washington, D.C. And through circumstances certainly beyond their control, eventually wound up again being shipped south to Northern Virginia when the EIR offices moved from New York City down to Northern Virginia back in 1984. Harley Schlanger, on the other hand, never looked back. <laughs> he had everything going for him back in Newark, New Jersey, back in the mid-1970s, and uh, wound up first shipping off with his wife Susan down to the Carolinas, North Carolina, kept going further south to Atlanta, and eventually wound up in Houston, Texas. So I think that uh, offers a perfect explanation as to why Harley had to go the extra mile and develop the kind of cultural armor to survive and actually prosper under those circumstances. So without further ado, let me introduce Harley Schlanger. Jeff left out the last stop, which is Hollywood. <laughs> well, let's see if we can activate those dangerous cognitive powers that so terrify the people that Stanley just introduced you to. As Lyndon LaRouche has stressed in recent weeks and elaborated in his keynote address yesterday, the problem of denial at present has assumed strategic proportions. That is, while many governments in the world and, and leading figures in governments and political parties have concluded that the present financial and monetary system is in the process of complete and total disintegration and are beginning to act in, under the, the direction in large part of Lyndon LaRouche to try and rebuild the world economy, the vast majority of Americans continues to wallow in their clueless pursuit of entertainment, seeking ever more dangerous pleasures to aid them in avoiding reality. In his presentation opening this panel, Stanley Ezrol introduced you to some of the critters who devoted their so-called creative lives to the destruction of what Lyndon LaRouche has called the American intellectual tradition. As you have heard, they deployed themselves consciously to turn Americans into the kind of anti-intellectual whiners and victims who would tolerate an election between these two modern-day know-nothings, W. Bush and Al Gore, and the kind of demented hedonists who frequent racetracks, who buy lottery tickets, and who enjoy watching the World Wrestling Federation SmackDown. In short, they've turned most of us into the human cattle that they wanted. Now, a recent example of this degeneration of our fellow citizens uh, can be observed in the numbers of people who have been flocking to see the latest garbage from Hollywood. The number one movie in the United States the past few weeks is a piece called American Pie 2, which supplanted Planet of the Apes, by the way. And American Pie 2, as I understand it, I haven't seen it myself, is a story centered around the escapades of a group of oversexed teenagers 
one of whom had sex with an apple pie. Now, if that's too tame for you for your entertainment, there's always internet porn. Uh, you can go to an all-night rave and, and get charged up with ecstasy. Or you can blow out your credit cards on Eddie Bauer auto accessories, or even perhaps one of these wonderful weekend cruises. And I just want to point out that there are some of you in this room who, when we call to ask you to help finance the movement, say, I have no money, no money, no money. And then we find out two weeks later, you just returned from a weekend cruise. So we know what you're up to. <laughs> now, how can we change a society which is in, de in denial, which has no sense of its history, which doesn't know where it is and how it got there? How can we reinstill in our citizens the sense of historic purpose for which our republic was founded? Or as Lynn asked many of us, such as Jeff and Stanley, who he recruited in the late 1960s from the rock, sex, drug counterculture, which by the way is now the dominant culture, it's no longer the counterculture, has America lost the moral fitness to survive? Now there's no question that we live in a culture which is plunging headlong into a dark age. And a key problem in our culture which we have to address is the desire to be popular, to be accepted. Take baby boomer culture, for example, which unfortunately you have to do. What was more important to my generation growing up than being popular? Listening to the right music, seeing the right movies, having the right opinion, wearing the proper clothes, even if that meant wearing bell bottoms. Now, when we were organized to rebel against what we considered the stifling bureaucratic conformity of the late 1950s and early 60s, what form did that rebellion take? How did we express our individuality? Well, we all grew our hair long. Most of us smoked pot. And we demonstrated against the Vietnam War, at least until we were no longer eligible to be drafted. But to hear it from the baby boomers today, you'd think that this so-called golden generation invented civil rights, invented youth, individuality, even sex. But in reality, my generation didn't invent this obsessive narcissistic focus on me, 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 me. We may have taken it to a higher level, and we have taken credit for it. And today, through the mass media and so-called globalization, we've created a new, more all-encompassing form of this moral degradation globally. However, throughout history, it's been precisely the ability of the oligarchy to induce a population to embrace as its own an infantile worldview, as Stanley was describing earlier, which has enabled that oligarchy to maintain its control over society. It is this oligarchical principle, whether it's enforced through the priesthood of Babylon, through the cult of Apollo at Delphi, through the bread and circuses of the Roman Empire, or the mixture, the choices of cultural degeneration that are offered today. Just take music, for example. You have the choice of classical oldies, and where but in a baby boomer culture would we refer to Elvis Presley as the classics? <laughs> we have rap with its limited vocabulary taking, taking us back to the dark ages directly. And of course, we have that favorite of Lyndon LaRouche, country western music. <laughs> but these forms of culture people hysterically claim is my music. It's my culture. This is who I am. You can't take it away from me. Just imagine defining yourself with country western music. Such songs as, if you want to keep the beer real cold, keep it next to my ex-wife's heart. <laughs> That's... You couldn't have made or, that. <laughs> or my personal favorite, my wife ran off with my best friend, and I miss him. <laughs> But it's this kind of culture, this kind of 
ability to induce people to actually identify with this kind of degeneration, which has been successful in reducing populations to little more than human cattle. And what I hope to show, and in, in, in what I hope will be an interesting demonstration this evening, is that it's only through the revival of the method of classical culture that we can free the majority of the population from this moral and intellectual self-degeneration, which we seem to choose, uh, and is enforced through prevailing popular opinion, and that is what is threatening to destroy us today. So let us take a look at classical drama through different eyes today. And in particular, I'm going to introduce you to a couple of the hist history plays of William Shakespeare to examine one excellent example of how classical theater, properly composed and presented, can transform an audience. Now, Lyndon LaRouche has addressed this principle repeatedly, including at this conference. And both he and Helga have taken up one of the principles of theater of Friedrich Schiller, that through experiencing a properly performed classical drama, you actually have an audience that leaves the theater better people than when they entered. So let's first investigate briefly this method to discover what it is we have to do if we are to pull humanity back from this dark age. Now, I was recently asked in one of my incarnations as someone who is involved with the fundraising, I was asked by an organizer, well, when you talk about classical culture, should we recite Shakespeare at the literature tables or on the phones or when they're having meetings with our contacts? And I said, well, that might be preferable to the kind of wild block things that I sometimes hear you say. It misses the point. The issue in classical drama, as in the plastic arts and in, in music, is to master the method employed by the artist. Because when we talk about the small numbers, and indeed there are very few great artists that are available to us, if you think about the vast span of history. But if you look at these individuals, you, you'll find that they have highly developed the capabilities that Stanley's friends and the Critter Company wish to destroy. Not just the ability to think, but connected with that is the necessity to be an ennobled soul. And so when you think about classical culture, the idea is not just to, to read it and, and recite it as human recitation machines, as human tape recorders, the way it's done in the schools, but to actually get into the mind of the author. So as Lynn says, that author comes to live in your own mind. So in organizing, as in classical art, the task is to make conscious to the audience the enslaving effects of the popularly accept accepted axiomatic assumptions and the postulates attached to them, which limit a population in the choices they make and which limit them to a fixed set of options, which are derived from the sense certainty which, dem which generates our thinking for the most part and is then reinforced by dull popular opinion. So to break these chains of slavery, it's necessary to induce a change in the identity of the person addressed, the person in the audience. To change that identity from one who's attached with whose attachment is to the petty concerns of getting along day by day. Instead, to get them to think from the perspective of one with a world historic identity, who recognizes that each of us has an explicit, efficient, and living connection to those who went before us, to those who fought to improve civilization before us, as well as an obligation to those who will follow us. To function as a world historic individual from that standpoint, one has to overcome those character flaws and defects which are rooted not just in the individual, but in the individual's submission to the pervasive corruption of the society. That is, you have to understand that an author in a classical drama is addressing individuals 
to get them to reflect on their own thought processes, their own submission to the views of the popular opinion, the vox populi, of those around them. And when the implications of these flaws and defects become conscious to the individual in the audience, and then a solution is presented to these systemic problems of the society, then, provided the individual has the courage to act, to overcome these flaws, then that individual becomes capable of what LaRouche calls dwelling in the simultaneity of eternity. So that your actions are not simply getting along day by day, but are in, developed by an appreciation of the scope of all of human history, both that before and hopefully that that goes on after us. In that way, one's mental life is lifted above the pervasive perversity around him and is situated in the further development of all mankind. Now, how does classical theater, especially historical tragedy, accomplish this? We have to turn for a moment to our friend Friedrich Schiller, who's provided us with the most thoughtful approach to what is necessary to change yourself and improve yourself. Schiller dedicated his whole life to this project, especially after seeing the disastrous results of the British-directed Jacobin mobs, which hijacked the French Revolution and turned that nation into a slaughterhouse. For this purpose, Schiller wrote the Letters on the Aesthetical Education to address precise, precisely this problem. How can the hearts and minds of citizens become ennobled so that they may lead the citizens of a nation to become truly human? Now again, Lyndon LaRouche has elaborated recently in some memos the problem that Schiller faced. How do you lift mankind above the corruption of the society, especially when we don't seem able to reach people in our day-to-day -day discussion, and that we therefore seem to share a fate in common with the beasts, that we will live and die with little opportunity to shape our destiny or that of society in the limited time we have between birth and death. Now, it's this fatal pessimism which Schiller addresses most profoundly and most personally in his writings. This personal self-examination, which Schiller insists is a precondition for overcoming this pessimism, is also crucial for organizing. In fact, everything I'm saying about the question of drama, tragedy, and classical art, the, the same process of, of actually understanding what it means should impel you to apply it when you organize. And I assume all of you are going to be organizing. <clears throat> so even though while we're speaking of the theater here, again, I want to emphasize that it's the method of the great tragedians and, and dramatists, especially Plato, Shakespeare, and Schiller, that we are discussing. Now, you must be, above all, honest and courageous. You must always seek the truth, no matter what the cost is to you personally. And this, of course, is one of the big problems for the baby boom generation. As Lynn has been discussing, the question of company manners. Unfortunately, it's not just out there. Too often, it's in with all of us, that we still have company manners, even though we think we're too sophisticated for such things. You'll find, if you're really honest, you're never too sophisticated to slide into some form of degeneration. You also have to be willing to take risks in order to arouse the human quality, which may be presently dormant in another person. Now, Schiller also wrote, though, that in great drama, that the stage must not be used merely to teach moral lessons, but to engage the audience in uncovering the secret workings of the human soul. Again, think about this in the context of the organizing process. How many of you think that you're organizing someone when you give them lectures about what's wrong with them? when you say, you're immoral, you should be doing what I'm telling you to do. How many of you think that's organizing? Now, I know no one's going to raise their hand, but how many of you do that when you're organizing? Or we have the, the what I call the Joe Friday approach. Nothing but the facts, ma'am. 
I'm going to tell you the what, where, when, how, and why of gold, and then you should organize. Now, it's the ability to change another, or to, to change another. You have to address what Lynn always refers to as the subjective. You have to realize that people have deep fears. The way you know it is look at yourself. That people feel impotent. They feel incapable of rising above things. The critters have done a damn good job in convincing us that we cannot reach others. It's also a fear of standing alone for principle. How many people could have done what Lyndon LaRouche has done? I'll tell you, none. Only Lynn, out of his whole generation, is still here to this day fighting for the principles that you presume, that he presumes many shared at the end of World War II. So that's the level on which we're discussing this question. Now, I'll just say on this, this point of objective information, you know, the idea in organizing is that you have to help someone identify the foolishness of the opinions that they're discussing to help them laugh at their own folly. Uh, you can't just fill someone in with objective information. In fact, the worst response you can get in organizing is when someone responds to you by saying, okay, thanks for the information. <laughs> if you hear that from someone, you know you haven't reached them at all. So how does this principle work in drama? I'm gonna rely on some quotes from Helga Zepp-LaRouche, who's done so much in introducing us to Schiller and has prodded us to make Friedrich Schiller our friend. Helga wrote the following about how classical drama, especially tragedy, functions. She wrote that the, the chief characteristic of tragedy is that it demonstrates that the human being is not the sole master of his own fate. Even if he does everything necessary, or everything necessity demands of him, summoning up all of his powers, violent developments may intervene, which destroy all his efforts, and perhaps even his very existence. This is the question of fate, that our fate may be too much, or it may seem to be too much for us to deal with. But seeing such conditions on the stage awaken in the character and in the viewers of the drama powers of self-assertion and moral resistance against unjust conditions. Such extraordinary situations demonstrate the true greatness of a person, because those who are only apparently great are crushed by this overwhelming fate. But the hero is the person who prescribes to himself a great idea and does not deviate from it even under the most adverse circumstances, such as popular rejection or even death. And some people think popular rejection is worse than death. Or the simple citizen who comes to understand that his own action may determine whether the course of fate can be altered. What Schiller said of this is that theater sheds light on man and our destiny and teaches us the great art of facing it bravely. Now, I'd like to attempt to demonstrate this process. We tried a little experiment in Los Angeles a couple weeks ago. And I'd like to do it by introducing you to a series of, of extraordinary plays by William Shakespeare on the Plantagenet kings of England. Now, again, keep in mind what I want you to look at and listen for. Not just to listen to the words or think the words sound good, not just to try and figure out the words, but to actually understand the mind of the author. In a memo Lynn wrote recently on this, he said the typical head of state, or perhaps we can add the typical organizer among our members and allies, takes on more the role of the actor on the stage than the author of the play. It is those who change or adjust the axioms of the historical process who determine the outcome of the play. So don't simply identify with the characters. This is part of the problem that Lynn was addressing this afternoon. When people 
look at the figure on the stage and say, oh, the poor fellow, he couldn't quite make it. That's the tragedy. The tragedy is the inability to overcome the flaws of the corrupt society and that no individual had the capacity, the honesty, the integrity, the toughness to overcome that corruption. So don't just identify with the characters, think like the author. Now, it's certainly not the, my intention tonight to give you a history of the Plantagenets, even if I could. But I want you to actually think about what Shakespeare was dealing with when he was writing his plays at the turn of the 17th century. He was living in the twilight of the reign of the Tudors as Queen Elizabeth, with no Tudor successor in sight, was nearing the end of her days. And he was trying to get the people of England to reflect back on what it was that, was, that the Tudors represented that was an improvement for England. For over 300 years, the Plantagenets, who were partly English, partly from Northwest France, had ruled England mostly to disastrous effect. The problem that, that existed at that time was that there was no conception of a nation, nation state. The Plantagenets ruled from the 12th century to 1485, or 18, yeah, 1485. And only toward the end of that period, following the Council of Florence, was there a conception of a nation state? And only with Louis XI of France in 1461 did the nation state come into existence. So you had essentially dynastic rivalries and squabbles, sometimes within families, sometimes between families. Sort of a modern day or an early day, I should say, soap opera. And it was during this period that you had the Hundred Years' War with France, the going back and forth between England and France of war, destructive war. Then you had the War of the Roses within England, which primarily consisted of, of people within the same family slaughtering each other. This culminated with the bloody reign of Richard III, and we're going to take a look at Richard tonight, one of the great true villains in history. But what was Shakespeare drawing upon to do this? As, as Lynn said today, Shakespeare, Shakespeare's mind was shaped by the work of Sir Thomas More, St. Thomas More. And More grew out of a, came out of a group of Platonists who were part of the Tudor Renaissance, which was a genuine renaissance in England, which began after Henry VII came to power through his victory of arms over Richard III at Bosworth Field in 1485. What Henry did was bring with him the best ideas from France from Louis XI's creation of the nation state. And he applied them with great success in England in his reign from 1485 to, I believe, 1509. Henry VII was guided in this by a conscious group of Platonists, people who went back to Plato, who especially went to northern Italy where a renaissance had been in effect and brought those ideas back with them. People such as John Collett, Grosin, and especially Thomas More, and their great collaborator and friend, Erasmus. So Shakespeare, reflecting back on that, through Thomas More's history of Richard III. And More wrote this history to make the point clear, not just that the Tudors were the coming of the, of, of the Messiah for England, but much more to show people what England had been before Henry VII, to show the corruption of the society. And this brings us to an interesting point that's just worth pondering for a moment, and people should take this up in your, your time when you do some work. The question of historic events, the ordering of events. What you get with drama is not necessarily so-called objective history. In fact, there are volumes written about how Shakespeare had the wrong date, or Richard supposedly killed someone who wasn't born yet, or various things of, of that sort. 
In Richard's case, it may have been possible. <laughs> As we, I would say, it's clear that the critters have killed many people who have not been born yet through this destruction of the nation state. But there's a truth in dramatic history which is higher than that of so-called objective history. And in fact, it's a dramatic truth that goes beyond the so-called facts, that's psychologically true, that gives you an insight into how people thought, how people lived. And the great dramatists do that when they present a parade of characters on the stage so that you look at the characters and you're actually seeing their minds as exposed by the dramatist. And by doing that, you're holding up a mirror to see how you think, to see how your society thinks. So that during the process of viewing a great classical tragedy, you're induced to reflect on your own corruption and degeneration at the same time that you see the alternative, that you could move that if you and everyone in the audience went out and acted properly, acted for the good, lived in the simultaneity of eternity, perhaps you could change the course of history. So the issue is to understand the degeneracy and brutality and corruption of pre-Tudor England. That's the issue that was taken up by Shakespeare, where you have the dramatist speaking directly to the audience. Now, a part of what that is done in this is to arouse the imagination in an audience. Now, you watch television today or the movies today, and what do you see? Is there anything left to your imagination, especially those of you who have cable? As, as Lynn says, what do you see on cable? They teach you how to undress and how to kill, sometimes at the same time. But the idea of the theater is what's on the stage is a direct interaction, a real interaction, not something passive, but something real between the actors on the stage and the audience, and through that process from higher up, the mind of the dramatist. And so I'm going to, with the aid of a, a good friend of mine, try to help recreate how this works in several of these, several scenes from these history plays. And what I've taken for this is something that Lynn has referred to several times. To start with the prologue to Henry V, to awaken, show how Shakespeare wrote this to awaken the imagination. Because what you have is a simple blank stage with very little lighting and a lone figure comes onto the stage to set the play of Henry V for you. And I've invited my friend Robert Beltran to read these passages for us. So this will be the prologue, the opening from Henry V. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon, since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million. And let us, ciphers to this greater compte, on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies, whose high upreared and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Piece out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth. 
For tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings, carry them here and there, jumping o'er times, turn, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For the which supply, admit me, chorus, to this history, who prologue like your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. Did you see the horses? Did you imagine the kings, the battles? If you see the Hollywood version of this recently by Kenneth Branagh, he leaves nothing to your imagination. And I know Stanley had something to say about the Branagh version, as did many of you when it came out. It starts with real horses, large numbers of them. And the, while the chorus that you just heard is recited, you don't have to imagine, even though Shakespeare said, imagine in your mind. No, it's right in front of you. You can sit back, pop a six pack, you know, switch back and forth to see the ball game if you want. <laughs> and the whole idea of drama is lost. So in this play, you have what you might see as the one hero of the, the series of plays on the kings, Henry V. But he's followed by a very weak son of his. In fact, Henry V died when his son was very young. I, I believe he was less than two years old when he became the king-to-be, or whatever they're called. And in the, th the three parts of Henry VI by Shakespeare, what you see is this corruption taking over and eroding the, the kingdom. And you see it in the court. You see it in the, the rivalries and the battles. And in the background, what you see is the emergence of the figure who typifies, or, or actually is, is the end product of this degeneration, Richard III. What I'd like you to hear now, in, in just a moment, after I say a couple more words about this, is you're going to hear Richard, Richard III, in his first soliloquy, in Henry VI, Part Three. Now, in a soliloquy, you have a character on a stage. Many times, and I'm sure all of you have this image, of an actor in tights. Especially if it's Shakespeare, it's got to be tights. Especially, especially since Laurence Olivier, who I understand thought he had great legs. And again, what you see is someone acting and prancing and, and trying to, to demonstrate something to you. But that's not what the playwright intended. What you're actually looking at is the thoughts of the character, as the character is discussing with you, giving you insight into his evil, or his good, or his confusion. And it's up, for you, up to you to decide what's going on, not the actor's ability to prance and dance and flex their calves. Now, when we deal with Richard III, as I said, he was the villain who ended the period of the Plantagenets. He came into the king, position of king, in 1483. And before him, there was Henry VI, then there was Edward IV, then Henry VI came back, then he was ousted again, and, and Edward IV came in, and finally Richard. But in Henry VI, Part Three, there's a very dramatic scene where you have a foreshadowing of the evil you'll see when Richard emerges to become the character of his own play. And so I'd like you to hear his soliloquy from Henry VI, Part Three. I. Edward will use women honorably. Would he were wasted, marrow, bones, and all, that from his loins no hopeful branch may spring to cross me from the golden time I look for. And yet between my soul's desire and me, the lustful Edward's title buried, is Clarence, Henry, and his son, young Edward, 
and all the unlooked-for issue of their bodies to take their rooms ere I can place myself. A cold premeditation for my purpose. Why then I do but dream on sovereignty, like one that stands upon a promontory and spies a far-off shore where he would tread, wishing his foot were equal with his eye, and chides the sea that sunders him from thence, saying, he'll lay it dry to have his way. So do I wish the crown, being so far off. And so I chide the means that keeps me from it. And so I say, I'll cut the causes off, flattering me with impossibilities. My eyes too quick, my heart or weans too much, unless my hand and strength could equal them. Well, say there is no kingdom then for Richard. What other pleasure can the world afford? I'll make my heaven in a lady's lap and deck my body in gay ornaments, and which sweet ladies with my sweet words and looks? Oh, miserable thought, and more unlikely than to accomplish 20 golden crowns. Why, love forswore me in my mother's womb, and for I should not deal in her soft laws, she did corrupt frail nature with some bribe to shrink mine arm up like a withered shrub, to make an envious mountain on my back where sits deformity to mock my body to shape my legs of an unequal size, to disproportion me in every part, like to a chaos, or an unlicked bear whelp that carries no impression like the dam. And am I then a man to be beloved? Oh, monstrous fault to harbor such a thought. Then, since the earth affords no joy to me but to command, to check, to forbear such as are of better person than myself, I'll make my heaven to dream upon the crown. And whilst I live, to account this world but hell, until my misshaped trunk that bears this head be round impaled with a glorious crown. And yet I know not how to get the crown, for many lives stand between me and home. And I, like one lost in a thorny wood that rends the thorns and is rent with the thorns, seeking away and straying from the way, not knowing how to find the open air, but toiling desperately to find it out, torment myself to catch the English crown, and from that torment I will free myself or hew my way out with a bloody axe. Why, I can smile and murder while I smile and cry content to that which grieves my heart and wet my cheeks with artificial tears, and frame my face to all occasions. I'll drown more sailors than the mermaid shell. I'll slay more gazers than the basilisk. I'll play the orator as well as Nestor, deceive more slyly than Ulysses could, and like a Sinon, take another Troy. I can add colors to the chameleon, change shapes with Proteus for advantages, and set the murderous Machiavel to school. Can I do this and cannot get a crown? <laughs> Were it farther off, I'll pluck it down. So you got that. <laughs> Richard's plotting. Long before, as he said, there were many, many people between him and the crown. Now, just fascinating is the very next scene takes place at the king's palace in France. And the character who's most interesting in this is King Louis XI, the creator of the nation state. As Lynn recently wrote, you have to look at these plays of the English kings as one continuing set. Because the question here is, will England continue under the, the brutal Plantagenets, or can England become a nation state? And what we see in the very next scene is a battle for Louis' support. On the one hand, you have the wife of Henry VI, Margaret of Anjou, who's there pleading with Louis to support putting Henry VI back on the crown, back on the throne, excuse me. The other main character there is the Earl of Warwick, who's there to make his plea for his sovereign, Edward IV, who had just overthrown Henry VI. And Warwick is there to seal the deal by asking that Louis XI support 
Edward IV and allow his sister to marry Edward IV. And Margaret, of course, is ranting, no, you can't do that. Warwick is saying, but we are the king. And Louis seems to say, well, after all, Margaret, he does wear the crown, and therefore he should get my sister. But while this scene is going on, word suddenly comes from England that Edward IV, while he had sent Warwick to negotiate for a wife, Edward IV had married Elizabeth Woodville, who Shakespeare leads us to believe was a very nice looking woman. And so Edward was corrupt. Instead of looking for the issue or the, the, the benefit of the state to an alliance with Louis XI, put his lust ahead of that. And so the scene ends with Margaret of Anjou jumping up and down, cheering, we won. Warwick turning against Edward IV and Louis saying, well, for my sister and for the sake of France, I have to go with Henry VI. Now Henry VI was defeated shortly after this and Edward IV came back as to the crown. And Edward was a relatively weak character. We'll take up now the very beginning of the last play of the series. There's another one, Henry VIII, but I think in terms of the Plantagenist, Richard III is the final one. Where we'll see again Richard, who's a little closer to the crown right now because his brother Edward is king. And what Richard does in this presentation, again, is give you his thoughts as to his chances to emerge victorious. So once again, Robert. This is the soliloquy that opens the play Richard III. And this is Richard. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. And all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass. I that am rudely stamped and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph. I that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. Why I, in this weak, piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time, unless to spy my shadow in the sun and descant on mine own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Plots have I laid inductions dangerous by drunken prophecies, libels, and dreams to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate the one against the other. And if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous, this day should Clarence be closely mewed up about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs the murderer shall be. Dive thoughts down to my soul. Here Clarence comes. Who says there are no conspiracies? <laughs> now, just to summarize the, the play briefly, because I, I'm not, I don't want to go through the whole play, but what happens is that Richard 
literally battles his way to the throne, killing a number of people, marrying the, the ex-widow of one of the people he has killed, in fact, in a, in a chilling scene, wooing the widow of a person, of, a, of the prince he's just killed, as a business proposition. Now, what's the point in Richard? What is Shakespeare getting at here? Richard doesn't become more evil during the play. He's evil from the moment you first see him, as you just heard. He's almost joking about how he doesn't like peace. He does better in wartime. And therefore, he has no problem carrying out a conspiracy to take the throne. So the, the question is not the character of Richard III. It's of the English people, as represented by the people in the court, because every single one of them, including those who don't like Richard, cut their deals with Richard. Starting with Anne Neville, who marries Richard even though he killed her beloved in the battlefield. Buckingham, who sold out for the promise of, a, of an estate. One after another, you see marched across the stage the courtiers who engage in the conspiracy with Richard even while talking against him and laughing at him behind his back. And in the background always, especially toward the end, you see that there's some hope for removing Richard from the throne and putting an end to the Plantagenet nightmare. And that hope is in the person of Henry Tudor, the Earl of Richmond, who went to France for aid and support and ended up with the heir of Louis XI backing him. That is that instead of having to cut a deal between Margaret of Anjou or the War Earl of Warwick, the decision was made to help bring down the Plantagenets from France by supporting a new king, a new dynasty, that in the figure of Henry Tudor. And so the, the play ends with Richard going to war, with, he, with Henry Tudor who comes over from France with an army. And some of the lords and noblemen desert Richard III for Henry. Some of them sit watching to choose sides at the end, so you know the corruption is still going to be there even if Henry wins. And you have two completely contrasting speeches given toward the end by Richard and Henry Tudor, Richmond. Contrasting speeches where Richard tries to rally the troops by saying, these are foreigners coming over here. They're going to take your wives and your land. You've got to fight them to protect the women of England. Whereas Richmond holds out a different vision. And we see in the very speech, the very end of the play, his last speech, Richmond presenting that vision, now triumphant. Richard, as you know, was defeated he fought nobly and valiantly. He was running around with the famous line, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. But he was defeated. And we have the final scene of the play as Richmond addresses his victorious uh, collaborators. Inter their bodies as becomes their births. Proclaim a pardon to the soldiers fled that in submission will return to us. And then, as we have taken the sacrament, we will unite the white rose and the red. Smile, heaven, upon this fair conjunction that long have frowned upon their enmity. What traitor hears me and says not amen? England hath long been mad and scarred herself. The brother blindly shed the brother's blood. The father rashly slaughtered his own son. The son compelled, been butcher to the sire. All this divided York and Lancaster, divided in their dire division. Oh, now let Richmond and Elizabeth, the true succeeders of each royal house, by God's fair ordinance conjoin together. And let their heirs, God, if thy will be so, Enrich the time to come with smooth-faced peace, with smiling plenty and fair, prosperous days. Abate the edge of traitors, gracious Lord, that would reduce these bloody days again and make poor England weep in streams of blood. 
Let them not live to taste this land's increase that would with treason wound this fair land's peace. Now civil wounds are stopped. Peace lives again, that she may long live here. God say amen. Obviously, I couldn't get Robert to play all the parts and put on the whole play. But you can read the play. You can put it on in your regions and locals. And you can look beyond the words to the mind of Shakespeare and actually see how he set out a task across these, I think it's eight plays or ten plays, to show the people of his time the benefits of peace and unity and the development of a nation as opposed to the squabblings of the rival dynasties that existed before. Now, in conclusion, I just want to add one additional point, which I think we would, would uh, miss if we, we didn't call its attention, call it to your attention. That is the question of humor in the theater. Now, some of you may have felt a little uneasy laughing at some of the statements of Richard the thought of someone so deformed that dogs bark at him when they see his shadow. Now, what Shakespeare does with that is actually, again, force you to think differently. Here's what Schiller says about this, and I think this is uh, absolutely critical for you to, to think about in this question of organizing. Because again, we're talking about the method of changing people. Schiller's talking about the, this is in the theater considered as a moral institution. And he's writing about what it is the theater does and how it does it. And he says, human folly can disturb social harmony just as easily as can crime and vice. A lesson as old as history teaches that in the fabric of human events, the greatest weights are often suspended by the most slender and delicate threads. And if we follow actions back to their sources, we will have to laugh 10 times before we draw back once in horror. With each day I grow older, my catalog of villains grows shorter, and my index of fools longer and more complete. He goes on in, in this vein saying, that the stage holds up a mirror to that most populous class, the fools, and exposes their thousand varieties to relief bringing ridicule. What in the former case it affected through emotional turmoil and horror, here it accomplishes, and perhaps more speedily and infallibly, through humor and satire. Man's pride is more deeply wounded by ridicule and contempt than his conscience is tormented by abhorrence. Our cowardice, when confronted with terror, crawls away in fear. But this very cowardice delivers us over to the sting of satire. The question of classical drama is therefore, I think, an urgent matter for organizing. To become familiar with a small handful of great dramatists to make them your friends, and to take the lessons from their lives, from their own work, and apply it to your mission in organizing to save the civilization today. So thank you very much. And let me just thank Robert for his excellent uh, For those of you who don't know, Robert spent most of the last seven years transversing the universe on the Voyager. So we're very glad he's back on Earth, and we hope we can get a lot of work for him doing Shakespeare. <laughs>
Well, happily, it's 1030, and the session is scheduled to conclude at 11 o'clock. So we have time for people to ask questions, comments. Um, I see Charles Notley moving towards the microphone. So I would just ask that uh, people either line up at the microphone, or if we get a long line, Charles will take names so that we can uh, take advantage of the remaining half hour. And again, let me remind people that uh, the literature table outside in the hallway uh, is going to be uh, staying open for another hour or more. And uh, as far as I know, the literature table will not be open tomorrow during the business meeting. So this is the last best opportunity to take advantage of the bargains to put together for yourselves organizing kits of literature, written material, special reports, videotapes, so that we take away from this conference both the sense of mission and the material that we need to be able to achieve it. So let's take the first question from the microphone. I was, I was listening at the last comment in terms of organization. Uh, uh, and organizing, and uh, one of the things that came to my mind is that, uh, and the problem that we're having with organizing, and the, that we, as we are trying to change people, uh, and we are trying to get the people to change themselves, and what is what happened is that it's hard to change people. I guess one of the great organizers in the history of mankind, Jesus Christ, failed at changing people. They, his disciples, you know, he, he didn't change not one of his disciples. They finally they changed themselves when they understood what he was doing, and this was after the crucifixion. How uh, it d does 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 these uh, it, is it then important to set up a situation where people have can change and, and and where they will change rather than we trying to change them? You know, one thing I've learned in in almost thirty years of organizing with. Uh, the LaRouche organization is that you really can't change someone else, but you can induce them to conclude that they do have to change. But as I said, you can't do it through uh, uh, moralisms or pounding them on the head, because the problem is most people, even under conditions of crisis, tend to want to just keep going along. And so the question that, that you're asking is, what do we do to change people? And I, I think the point I was trying to make is that we have to take the best tools available to us, the work that's been done by the greatest thinkers in history, people such as Schiller, who's worked on this in a way outside of Lyndon LaRouche and Helga. I think Schiller has probably done more on this question than anyone else. So what do you take away from that? Well, I think it's this question of a combination of the hard, blunt truth plus humor so that people can finally step back and say, gee, you know, I like the Southern strategy or I trusted George Bush. What a fool I was. But you can't just tell someone that and then try to get them to agree because maybe they'll agree with one or two points. But if you don't change their thinking and you don't change their heart, there's no durable change, and they're likely to go right back to making the wrong decision. So I think the point of what I was trying to get at is that we do have to change people. And the advantage we have right now is that the thinking of most people is being challenged. The axioms are being ripped to shreds. Again, as one of our, our organizers said some time ago in Los Angeles, if you do good organizing, when you're done, 
the ground around you will be littered with the bloody corpses of dead axioms. That the beliefs that people have are going to be, they're going to be questioning them. So our job is to show them that there is a better way of thinking, a different way of thinking. That first of all, as Lynn said, there's a solution to the problem. That we can give up this system without risking anything. And that, in fact, by giving up the system, not holding on to it, we become free. You see, someone has asked me the other day, how do you be funny? You know, Lynn said you've got to use humor. So one of our organizers went out and rented four Abbott and Costello movies, I think. <laughs> and, you know, that may be, that's, this is someone who's younger, but that's the baby boomer method, right? You know, you learn something from Abbott and Costello. No, to be funny you have to first give up your own ego. Because to be truly funny, you have to be free, in a sense vulnerable, but free of the pretensions that you're addressing in the other. And if you shed that, if you get rid of that, then you can speak the truth. Look what Lynn does. Lynn is one of the funniest people you'll ever hear, even at his most serious. And that's because to be truly serious and to be funny in this higher sense of irony are the same thing. Because what is irony? It's showing someone that the problem they have is that there's a paradox. That the way they think generally, what they believe doesn't function. And that to hold on to that is driving them further and further from solving the problem. And that is funny to watch people twist themselves up to hold on to an axiom. The case I gave the other day of a guy who wants to use his last dollars to buy a videotape to pop into the VCR right before his house is foreclosed. So you have to use these paradoxes and ironies that exist in all of the, everyone's mind to get them to reflect on how they think. And I think it's important to use great music, great art, great drama to give you more tools to do that. Sure, it's hard to change people. If it were easy, we wouldn't need our organization. But our society is going to hell because it is hard. But fortunately, Lynn has given us the tools to do that, provided we have the courage to take them. Any other takers? <laughs> yes, Stan, I, uh, Monty Connell from Los Angeles. I read with great interest your, your article on the, the lost corpse and, and the whole background and history and so far as how this was developed through uh, literature, through inculcating the culture and so far as uh, uh, to undermine the culture and to recruit from it. Now, could you g maybe give some insight into how, with the Jacobin mobs, how that's used and so far as recruitment? I understand, like, with the methods that might be used and so far as uh, uh, not just through major media, but through, like, hellfire clubs. that They used to have hellfire clubs and now on campuses and so forth. How would you see this as the means by which these people are recruited, these kinds of things? Well the, well, the way it works is this. The fundamental idea is that ideas don't work. That what's important to you is your immediate senses, your immediate surrounding. One of the most important ideas in the Jacobin and the other circles is that it is tyranny for somebody to act on the basis of an idea. And I'll take my stand, the agrarians refer to this fabulous notion of the general welfare. People are concerned with their own welfare. They're concerned with the welfare of their nation, their community. Any, any idea of the general welfare, I mean their neighborhood, their community, any idea of the general welfare, any idea of the future of the posterity is meaningless and what you the role of literature and of art in these circles and 
you look at the kind of things that are popular amongst Jacobin types, Dostoevsky, Faulkner to a certain extent, the existentialists and so on. Well, you have on the one hand a total immersion in what you would immediately recognize to be the sensual. You know, pick up a Faulkner novel. I walked through the magnolias and felt the mud squish under my feet as the aroma of the honeysuckles came toward my nostrils. And then I saw through the windows of the shanty temple puking in her bed. I memorized that. But, the <laughs> but then you start reading and you, know, you think, for instance, of Dostoevsky's Raskolnikov. Um, and you, it, there's this narrative of the thoughts occurring to Raskolnikov. You get the narrative in all of these novels. And what you realize is that these thoughts are not really thoughts. They're not really cognition. They are other objects of sense perception. Just as you feel your feet sinking into the manure, you experience the thought running through your head, which may be stinkier. And then you think, you know, and then put yourself into that mindset and you get, you know, this, you know, the, the kind of thing that you get, for instance, around reparations, where somebody gets obsessed, you know, I have to get my money back. My great, great, great grandfather was a slave, I think. You know, for all he knows, his great, great, great grandfather was a slave owner, black, white, or some other color. But he's going to get his money back. I'm an American Indian. We need our land back. You know, what about the, the American Indian tribes that his ancestors kicked off the land? Do they need their money back from him? But you get, you know, the, once you get into this obsession entirely, with viewing everything from the standpoint of your immediate obsession, then you have the, the opportunity where somebody gets turned to violence. You know, all I know is what I see. All I know is what's physically in front of me. What do I do? Get out of my face. Right? You run into these guys you talk to. Get out of my, you know, you're invading my space. Or, or you've probably run into this one. You know, you start talking to someone and they say, thank you. And then you keep talking to them. And they say, thank you. You keep talking to them. I said, thank you. <laughs> You're supposed to understand something from that, right? But that's the way that it develops. And the point is that what you develop in somebody is that all he is is his immediate perception. He has no concern for making the lives of the people that made his life possible meaningful. He has no concerns for the lives of people that come after him. He is induced to believe, as John Locke said, that his property is a right more important than life or death, and you have the makings of a Jacobin terrorist. I think there's an added dimension in the uh, era of the drug rock sex counterculture, which you could kind of summarize with the slogan, better living through chemistry. <laughs> uh, don't underestimate the impact of uh, the vast volume of drugs that were thrown at the uh, generation of the Jacobins to be. Uh, one of the uh, fellow travelers of the agrarians 
back in the 1930s and 40s concentrated on the, also the question of music. A man named Theodore Adorno wrote a book in the 1940s called The Philosophy of Modern Music. And he wasn't even talking about Elvis Presley or the Rolling Stones. He was talking about Schoenberg and Stravinsky, who were already bad enough. And what he said is the objective of modern music is to drive people psychotic and to actually use the destruction of that which you heard this morning, last night, great music, uh, destroy that and destroy along with it the souls of the people who are subjected to this other garbage. And Adorno said ultimately that what you really want to achieve uh, in order to create the type of Jacobin state of mind that we're seeing unleashed now is you want music that actually induces people into a state of necrophilia. And what he means by that is not something, a literal act necessarily, but the idea of the equation of sexual pornography and murderous violence. So just think about much of what comes out of Hollywood, that comes out of the rock music industry from the standpoint of how much of that, even Harley's WWF uh, slam dunk, <laughs> smackdown. <laughs> this particular preponderance of pornography associated with violence is a dominant factor in the cultural life. And you get a very good idea of what the ingredients are for creating this kind of Jacobin state of mind or lack of state of mind. We have time for a couple of more questions. Yes, um, uh, my name is Michael Godek. I'm from uh, Dallas, Texas these days. So I'm, I guess I'm operating behind an enemy lines as well as Harley. Um, this is for Stan. I read, uh, I read your uh, piece on uh, Seduced from Victory with great interest, and one of the questions that I had from it um, uh, has to do with, um, with really all the biographies of Franklin Roosevelt uh, deal with the question of, uh, of his battle against the, pop the, the popularization of fascism in the United States in his time. And, uh, but the biographies really s limit the discussion to the characters of, um, uh, oddly, Huey Long, uh, Father Coughlin, uh, 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 Charles Lindbergh, and, uh, and uh, Franklin's associate, um, uh, Joseph P. Kennedy. And it seems like your article pointed to maybe a more uh, deeper and a more accurate uh, identification of who these enemies of Franklin Roosevelt's policies were, uh, although uh, it didn't seem like it dealt with it directly. So I was hoping you might elaborate on that and perhaps point us to some other sources in this investigation. Well, I would point you to this, which, which is that Yui Long although he grew up in Louisiana, came from a family which was pro-Lincoln. He was pro-Lincoln. What he did in Louisiana was to work in parallel with the kinds of things that Roosevelt was doing with the New Deal and with the Tennessee Valley Authority, including building highways, building bridges. He built Louisiana State University and so on. Um, Probably not everybody in his environs was a total saint. Um, probably not many of them were as evil as you might think he was. I'll, I'll give you one example of this. Um, as I pointed out in the article, in 1935, Robert Penn Warren and Cleant Brooks went to Louisiana State University and they were given the joint editorship, editorship of Southern Review. Now, I'll just interject an aside on the last point Jeff was making, which is that one of the other figures who you may not think of as being quite your pro-Confederate Ku Klux Klansman, who contributed to the first issue of the Southern Review, who contributed to it otherwise, who contributed to the Virginia Quarterly Review, which was another one of these literary magazines in the agrarian orbit, was Aldous Huxley of Doors of Perception Mescaline 
fame, and so on. So to go back to the Huey Long story. Um, friends of Robert Penn Morin's and Cleanth Brooks's assassinated Huey Long in 1935. At that point, Cleanth Brooks and Robert Penn Warren were openly engaged in organizing support for Mussolini and for Hitler. Fifty years later, in 1985, in the context supposedly of celebrating the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Southern Review, but also celebrating the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Huey Long, Robert Penn Warren commissioned Ken Burns to produce a movie on Huey Long in which you can see, amongst other things, old Robert Penn Warren saying what he didn't like about Huey Long, namely his destruction of environment, building of industry, and so on, and saying, he was a Mussolini. Apparently hoping everybody would forget which side Penn Warren was on at the point when his, his friends killed Huey Long. Um, what you've got is a total fraud which comes under the heading of the anti-authoritarian personality cult, which is pushed by something called the Frankfurt School by Hannah Arendt, who was one of the pro-Nazi refugees who had to leave Germany because she was Jewish, and was brought to the United States, amongst other things, by institutions like the New School for Social Research, which agrarian Stark Young was involved in, along with Bertrand Russell, H.G. Wells, and so on. What's the anti-authoritarian school? It is the hatred of cognition. It is, the, it is the idea that somebody who claims that he can know something without the authority sanctioned by the little green men is dangerous. It's the same idea on which Lyndon LaRouche has been attacked. It's the same sense that most people in this room have had at one point or another. You know, when you hear, when you heard Harley say, LaRouche is the only man of his generation who's still fighting in this way. How many of you heard that tingle in the back of the head? Well, can we really say that? I mean, is he really different than everybody else? You know, you look at it, nothing mystical about it. You know, where are the other ones? You know, <laughs> you know I mean, especially from people who believe that the only way you know anything is directly through your senses. Well, where are they? <laughs> Show them to us. Um, but, in, you know, in, in give you the theoretical framework, that's what, you're, what was involved in the attacks on Roosevelt and the attacks on Huey Long are the attacks on the American intellectual tradition, which are the attacks on cognition, which are attacks on the idea that human beings can contribute to making the world better. And I would just suggest looking at things from that standpoint. Um, and also look at the fact that what, what you very rarely find in history, and this is one of the important reasons for studying Shakespeare's history plays, for instance, you very rarely find purely evil or purely good people. You do find things that are good. You find ideas that are good. You find possibilities that are good. And one of the main advantages of tragedy over history, which makes tragedy even more truthful than history, despite the fact that certain factual facts and events may be altered from the way they really occurred, is that what tragedy makes possible is to make visible the possibilities for action which may not have actually occurred in history. 
but by showing those possibilities for action to you, it, it makes it possible for you to understand what were the real issues involved. The issues were not what did happen, the issues were what might have happened. Not very interesting to look at what did happen, frankly. Um, and the thing that, that you know, you've got is certain obvious lies, like the Robert Penn Warren, he was a Mussolini, um, combined with the fact that what people will do is they'll say, well, you know, so-and-so was once seen in a restaur restaurant with thus and such, and then after that, that fellow walked out of the restaurant, hopped on a bus, and drove 300 miles, and there he ate non-kosher meat. Uh, this will be the last question, but both Stan and Harley will be available afterwards. I've got a few brief announcements before we close out the session. But uh, My name is Scott Alsop, and unlike Michael, I've lived in Texas all my life, so I've uh, been in a cleanse cleansing process of the Southern strategy. So, But I understand why there's... There's, there's art and poetry and drama and why that's important is, is a useful tool for getting the thinking process going. But on the other hand, I've always wondered in the interest of if you're trying to portray an idea or concept to a population, uh, why would you take such a lengthy measure to portray that some people, somebody might look at a piece of art and not really get what's trying to be conveyed or, or watch a play and not really get the idea. When I just tell your ideas, but uh, it, it just seemed like uh, it, in the form that it's in, it was uh, mutually exclusive for the intellectuals or people that wanted to become more intellectual-like. But... Uh, one, one additional comment, since Robert's here, this organization's always reminded me of uh, like being like the Maquis. It's, uh, <laughs> despite what the oligarchy thinks, they just keep right on going doing what they think is right. Scott, stay at the microphone for a second, because let me ask you a question. Yeah. You organize, sure. right? Right. Okay. Now, what happens when you give someone a, quote, idea? When you just say to them, you should support LaRouche, and here's why. What happens? They freak out. <laughs> now, let me ask you a, a question, first of all. Do you, tell, do, you, do you bring up Lynn right away in the organizing? Not all the time, no. Okay. I'm honest. Well, that's a good start. Now, you see... <laughs> The, the point that I think so many people miss, and Stanley brought up, Lynn has been bringing this up for years, that we somehow think that because the population is corrupt, there's no question about that, this population is corrupt. It can't think. It can't put things together. So you go out and organize and you think, I'll give them a little hook they can, I can hook them with, something I can grab them and then I'll talk to them a little bit, and if they agree, then I'll spring LaRouche on them. <laughs> now, have you tried that? I have before. And how many of them ended up contributing to the LaRouche campaign? Uh, I'd be a negative on that. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't work. Because the kind of ideas we're talking about cannot be transmitted in a form that's characterized or characterized by the internet, the information revolution. You I understand. See, What's hard is you usually don't get that much time with them, and it's it's hard to soundbite this organization. Well, of course it is, but the the thing you have to do that's why you have to go for maximum shock up front. <laughs> <laughs> 
If you're not going to have much time, get the mouth dropping effect. Don't beat around the bush, so to speak. Coming from Texas, you know what happens if you beat around the bush. <laughs> you get right to the heart of the matter. I'm with LaRouche. You got a problem with that? You, you, you bring up an idea. I mean, what, what most, and then what, what happens when people start freaking out? How many people have you talked to who say, oh, LaRouche is no good, who have actually read anything Lynn has ever written or heard anything Lynn has said? That'd be a negative again. All right. <laughs> So what does that mean when you're talking to someone and they have an opinion on LaRouche? Uh, I think LaRouche mentioned it earlier today. Americans do tend to lie sometimes. Sometimes, yes. So you're getting there. I think since time is short, we can't conduct a full Socratic dialogue tonight, Scott. But I think you can answer the question for yourself. Great ideas cannot be transmitted one-on-one in some kind of information format. The purpose of great art, or the, the, what great art, and great art is not just a tool. It's a means by which ideas are conveyed through what LaRouche writes about as the process of metaphor, that you cause someone to discover an idea in their own mind that's in your mind because you've discovered it. And if someone actually makes a discovery of that sort, it changes them. Whereas if you just pound on someone which I know you don't do, but if you ever tried it and pounded and pounded and pounded, and finally you told them you wouldn't get off them until they said, I'll support LaRouche, as soon as you got off them, they'd be out the door saying, I had my fingers crossed. So the question of organizing is the question of changing people. And to change people so they can grasp a great idea requires something different than a sound bite. But if you want to get them to spend the time Hit them with what Lynn calls the maximum shock. I'm with LaRouche. Here's what we're doing to save civilization. What do you think of that? Now, if it's someone you know, you may have to wait for them to get off the floor first. You're with LaRouche? I thought you were a friend of mine. (laughs) Or something of that sort. So I really think that in the organizing, and the reason I tried to, to organize my presentation this way, is that the question of drama, the question of Shakespeare or Schiller, these are people who have studied history. They've studied ideas. Shakespeare's view of history was shaped by Thomas More, who was there, who worked with Henry VII, who knows how hard it is to take a king that you trained from childhood and turn him into a decent guy. Look, Henry VII's son, Henry VIII, had the advantage of Thomas More and Erasmus. And he still couldn't keep his zipper, his fly zippered. He still couldn't run a kingdom. So the point is, it's difficult. We have an opportunity now. We can't blow it by going for simple, low-level agreement. And every one of you who organizes, you should leave here with that sense, that you're not going to go out ever again looking for simple agreement, because if you find it, it ain't worth nothing. You've got to organize to change someone. And what that means primarily is you have to change yourself. You have to be honest and open and fight with that part of you that wants to just go along and just wants to be popular. Okay? We'll continue this at the next Dallas chapter meeting.